All right, now we're going to move on to talk a little bit about drives, their cables, and the connectors they need. So a computer might have one or more hard drives, you know, an optical drive such as a DVD or Blu-ray player, a tape drive, maybe even an old floppy drive, and some other type of drive. But for them to work, they need to receive power. So for that to happen, they have to have a power cable. And then they must also have a data cable through which the data can be transferred through the motherboard. Now there are two standards that hard drives, especially our you know, old optical drives used for both uh, the connectors and those are the serial ATA and the parallel ATA. Now the serial ATA is, you know, we also mainly just call that the SATA drive and you might hear it pronounced SATA, but these are what we mainly use today. Now the old parallel ATAs were much slower than our current SATAs. Um, we also call those an IDE because of the interface. Now the SATA drive has a 7 pin cable and for the data and then it has a 15 pin cable for its power to be supplied to it. Now the parallel has a 40 pin ribbon cable and the connector and I'll show you those on the next slide here. Now here's a picture of an IDE hard drive and you can see there on the bottom left that we have a parallel cable. That's a 40 pin cable. And generally on these old drives you want to go no longer than an 18 inch maximum length for your cable. Now there's actually 80 pins here but only 40 of those pins are used for transmission where the other 40 are used for some shielding. And that's just to kind of prevent crosstalk and stuff like that. And as you see here on the picture on the bottom right how those cables go in. We have the IDE connector that has a cable key and you can see that here on the left picture that cable key there prevents you from installing the IDE connector incorrectly. You also notice that there is a stripe here. Now that stripe allows you to know where the location of pin 1 is located. So There's really not a way that you can get these in correctly. You also notice that there is a blank key spot here and that makes you, you can make sure that you are installing it correctly as well and that you have the right cable. Now here on the far right is where we get our four pin Molex that provides the power to our ID or PETA hard drive. You can see we have those listed down here, so the colors red, black, black, which are both grounds, and then our 12 volt yellow. So that is essentially the IDE or PETA cable and or hard drive and its connectors. Here is an SATA, our more modern hard drives, and you can see that we have a completely different style of how we get our data and our power here. We have two connectors here. Like I said, we have our 7-pin data cable here, and you can count those there. And then we have our 15-pin SATA power cable. That allows us to power up the hard drive. Now the great thing about our SATA is the simplicity of the design. You can see that we have an L shape here and here that allows us to know how we are putting the cable in to make sure that we put it in correctly. And on your motherboard you'll have the same type of connector on the motherboard that allows you to plug in to the motherboard as well so it's very simplistic. Now let's take a look at an even older technology here with maybe you'll come across this in a floppy drive which is just a three and a half inch disk that goes into those and those hold about 1.44 meg of data. I know that's hard to fathom that we actually had a storage device that only held that much but it did the job at the time that we used them. Now the floppy drive uses a 34 pin twisted cable rather than the 40 pin that you saw for the parallel IDE. Now here I have a image here of the old style 34 pin twisted cable that connects to this floppy drive and you can see where that red arrow is that is where the twist is and that's how we get the name the twisted cable and you can see that there are two connectors in the back of that to allow us to hold up to two different floppy drives 
Okay, now let's move into talking a little bit about electricity and safety. And we want to be able to protect ourselves when we're working on computers as well as the equipment against any type of electrical dangers. And to do that, it's important to know a little bit about electricity and its dangers. So some of the terms you want to talk about here are alternating current, direct current, rectifier, inverter, transformer, what's you know AC, DC, all of that, amps, volts. So first of all, let's start talking about volts. You've probably seen that. You know you might have seen something that's 115 volts, 110 volts. Well, what does that really mean? A volt is just a measure of electrical force, and we use the symbol capital V to represent the volts. Now your power supply steps down the voltage that's coming in from the house at 115 volts and, and converts that down or steps it down to a 3.3, a 5, and a 12 volt area that the computer components are going to be able to use. Now when we talk about amps, an amp is a measure of electrical current, whereas the volt was a measure of electrical force. So an amp being electrical current, we, met, we symbolize this with the capital A. As an example, an LCD monitor that you might have hooked up to your computer requires about 5 amps to operate successfully. Whereas a, you know, if you've ever played with one of those little small laser pointers, those use about 2 amps. And then when you're using your CD-ROM in a computer, that only takes about 1 amps. So now you kind of see how the amps and volts are measured. Now electricity can either be alternating current, which is AC, or direct current, which is DC. And alternating current kind of oscillates between negative and positive, where a direct current travels only in one direction. This type of current is used by most electronic devices. We have a rectifier, which is a device that converts from alternating current to direct current. Another term is an inverter, which is a device that converts just the opposite of that. It goes from taking electricity from a direct current and changing that to an alternating current. And lastly we have a transformer which is a device that changes the ratio of voltage to current. Now, The power supply used in computers is both a rectifier and a transformer. Now, AC travels on a hotline from your power station to a building and returns to the power station on a neutral line. When the two lines reach the building and enter an electrical device, such as a lamp or any type of you know, hair dryer or whatever, the device controls the flow of electricity between the hot and neutral lines. Now if an easier path is available to electricity, it will definitely follow that path. So never put yourself in a position where you are the path of least resistance between a hot line and a ground, because this can create a what's known as a short or a sudden increase in flow that can also create a sudden increase in temperature, which could be enough to start a fire. Now, to prevent uncontrolled electricity in short, a neutral line is grounded. Grounding line simply means that the line is connected directly to the earth, so that in the event of a short, the electricity flows into the earth and not back to the power station. Now, this serves as an escape for out-of-control electricity because the earth is always capable of accepting a flow of curtain. Now, as electricity is moving along its path, you'll notice that there are several times that the neutral line is grounded. And, in fact, you can see these on electrical poles. You know, these electric poles are grounded. You've probably seen a ground uh, pole outside of your house. So there's many times that this neutral line is grounded along its travel path. Now you've probably noticed that there are two different types of plugs that you're going to encounter. We have a three prong plug and a polarized plug. And with the three prong difference is the three prong plug has a ground to it, whereas the polarized plug does not. Now sometimes you will need to maybe test a receptacle to see if it if everything is wired correctly. And to do this you simply use a receptacle tester. If something's not grounded properly, you're definitely going to know when you experience that short and hopefully never a uh, fire, but that is the case when you go into a new location and you don't really know if everything's correct. Sometimes when people are doing electrical work, 
they do mess this up. I have seen a case where the instance was not grounded and we tried to plug in uh, some computer equipment and it shorted out right away due to poor wiring techniques. This can be a very costly mistake. So it doesn't hurt to get one of those receptacle testers. If you're going into a new location, make sure you test those plugs. And it's simplistic. All you're really going to be doing is testing to verify that your hot, neutral, and ground wire are all wired correctly. Now, as a tip, when working with any type of electrical device, disconnect the power if you notice a dangerous situation that might lead potentially to an electrical shock or even a fire such as if you notice that a power cord is frayed or damaged, if perhaps some type of liquid has been spilled, if the device has been dropped or physically damaged, inspect that as well. If you happen to smell a strong electronic odor, and you will definitely know what that is, then that is a definite potential danger there as well. Obviously if you see any smoke, that's a good chance that there is a fire or an electrical issue nearby. If on your computer you notice that you hear a very loud whining noise, this could be an example of the power supply going bad or even your fan going bad so then your computer is going to overheat. So make sure you take care of that and check for that as well. That's important when you're working on electronic devices to ground yourself. And one way you can do this is with an anti-static grounding bracelet. And a lot of kits that you buy for your PC repair kits will come with this or you may need to purchase one on your own. Take a look at an example of that grounding bracelet or grounding strap. You can see you have the clip that will be connected to some type of base that is actually grounded so the electricity will not be absorbed by you and you have the strap that will go around your wrist to make sure that you are as well grounded. Now when you're working with power supplies, printers, and old CRT monitors, those contain capacitors. Do not ground yourself because power can flow through you to the ground and you may get shocked. Power supplies and monitors, this is a new term that I want to introduce called FRUs or field replaceable units. This means you're expected to know how to replace, not how to repair it. Having said that, uh, in today, you know, a lot of today's monitors, especially on laptops and even the LCD and LED ones that you have on your desk, you can replace different parts on there. And there are many different parts through your computer that are going to be field replaceable units, such as RAM and hard drives. Even a motherboard can be considered a field replaceable unit as long as you're careful in making sure that you get the correct one. But just want to introduce that term to you here. Uh, so just, you know, know that there are parts that you can replace and there are some that you know you you cannot replace and sometimes you have to go through third parties to even get those parts that you're trying to replace because the manufacturer states that you know that's not something they can send to you because it's not a field replaceable unit now when working around electrical fires that may occur never ever use water to put out a fire because the water is going to act as a conductor to allow that electricity to flow through. Instead use a fire extinguisher that is definitely rated to put out an electrical fire in being in a class A, B, or C. And you can see that these fire extinguisher ratings are as follows. Class A can use water to put out fires caused by wood, paper, or other combustibles. Obviously if you're using having an electrical fire you would not use class A. Class B fire extinguishers can put out fires caused by liquids such as gasoline, kerosene, and oil whereas for those of us in the IT world we are going to try to keep around some class C fire extinguishers they, because those use non-conductive chemicals to put out a fire which is caused by electricity. Having said that, if you, you may want to make sure that you have you know multiple fire extinguishers around of different classes based on the area that you're working in and what type of potential hazards you may be facing. But generally in your computer labs that you're going to be working in, make sure that you have a Class C fire extinguisher definitely in place for any type of fire that may be caused due to electricity. If you ever notice that you touch something and all of a sudden there's a little spark, well that's electrostatic discharge or ESD. This is an electric charge at rest. Now when two objects with similar electric charges touch, electricity pass between them until those charges become equal. Now, 
ESD is something you as an IT technician definitely need to be worried about because it can cause different types of damage. You can have a catastrophic failure which destroys the component. If this occurs, then that's going to be a costly mistake. An upset failure is damage that the component so it does not work as it's intended. Now both types of these damage that occurred by ESD can permanently affect the device. So make sure that you're grounded. Make sure that you know you have a ground mat or make sure that you're not rubbing you know different types of materials before touching. You know dust on a floor can create ESD as you're going to touch a network device. Make sure that you've released that electrostatic discharge so that you're not creating any type of these types of damage. Now I just mentioned the ground bracelet or we can all call this an ESD strap it's however you want to name it as you're doing searches to find one uh, anti-static wrist strap, ESD bracelet whatever search field you want or search criteria you want to use you can find these such as on Newegg.com uh, I just mentioned ground mats all these ESD mats uh, a lot of times your bench technicians are going to have this underneath their working spot so that they can be grounded as well. Now, there are also static shield bags. You've probably seen some of these. If you've ever ordered a hard drive or seen a hard drive come in, they are in a, in a static shielding bag. And there are also anti-static gloves uh, that prevent the electrostatic discharge between you and a device if you're wearing those gloves. So there are definitely many ways to protect not only yourself but the devices that you're working with from electrostatic discharge. Now I want to talk about some basic rules to follow to protect equipment from static discharge. Alright, so rule number one, when passing a circuit board or other component to another person, ground yourself first and then touch the person before you pass it. Rule two, leave components inside those anti-static bags until you're ready to install them or use them. That way there's no way of them getting that electrostatic discharge. Rule number three, work on hard floors, not carpet. I've seen many videos where people are doing work and they're working on carpet. I'm like, oh, come on, that's such a bad thing. And, and maybe they've taken more than one take because they realize that they ruined a part because they had that ESD on them. All right, rule four, don't work on a computer in a cold and dry atmosphere. A cold and dry atmosphere are the worst environments to work in for ESD. Unfortunately for us as IT professionals, our server rooms and IT rooms are generally in the 60s and we can keep them dry as well. So just be careful and always be aware of ESD. Rule number five, remove packing tape and cellophane from around your work area because that type of material attracts ESD. So as you're unboxing a new computer or server or any type of field replaceable units, make sure you get that type of packing material out of the area before you continue to work. And then rule six, obviously keep components away from hair and clothing as we all know. As you've probably rubbed your uh, hands on you know, your hair before and felt that discharge or clothing and then touched something just to feel that shock as a little child. Well now you know that as an adult and working in the IT field, that's a bad thing.